Hi, this is Circe Olson Wessner, and I'm the director of the Museum of the American Military Family in Tejeras, New Mexico, and this is our podcast, At Ease. I'm speaking to Army veteran Robert Wunsch um, via the telephone. He's the author of several books that we're going to talk about today, and I wanted to say hi, Robert. Thanks for joining us on the, on the phone. Hi, Circe. It's nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm really excited uh, to talk to you. I think you write some books that some of our listeners will really enjoy. Um, but first, I wanted to talk to you about your career in the military a little bit. Um, I met you through a book project I'm working on with the, um, about the 11th and 14th Cavalry in Germany during the Cold War, and you contributed a story to it. Um, so when were you in the Army, and was it a career? And what branch? Obviously, Cav, but let's make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I had a rather strange career in the Army. Uh, it was four years. I was an ROTC graduate of the University of Tennessee, and I got a regular Army commission. Wanted to go to Germany, so I, I signed up for the field artillery. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, for some reason, they sent me to the infantry school. Uh, that's something I'll never be able to explain. I went to the infantry school. And then while I was there, I went to jump school because I was regular army, and that was either rangers or jump, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to go spend a lot of time in the woods. Ah. <laughs> so I I went to artillery school, and then I went to Germany, and they put me in a cavalry regiment, which is only the only the army could do that. Well, it does. So by the time, <laughs> by, by the time, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say it does seem a little bit com convoluted there. <laughs> Well, as it turned out, by the time I had met my future wife, she had worked for the post engineers and knew a lot about Caterpillar equipment that was being used in Germany at the time. I had gotten an offer to go to work for Caterpillar in Peoria, Illinois, and she thought it would be better, I would be better suited to be a Caterpillar person than a military person. Ah. And after some discussion, four years later, I got out of the Army and went to Caterpillar. That was in 1966. So four years, four years in Germany, minus about eight months in an infantry unit in Kansas, in Kansas uh, the 1st Infantry Division. Ah, well, and you know, from my husband's experiences in uh, the cavalry, you spent a great deal of time in the woods trying to avoid being in the woods. <laughs> so. uh, we certainly did, with uh, 20 Russian Army divisions across the border, we were almost always in the field, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Um, so you've written uh, several books, and uh, my husband um, just finished one of the ones that you wrote called Ashes on His Boot, and he really, really enjoyed it. He gave me a blow-by-blow -blow, uh, synopsis of it, but I wanted you to tell our listeners um, a bit about the book. Okay. Sure. Ashes on His Boot, and... Uh I got the idea from reading other uh, Western, uh, not novels, but documentaries. Mm -hmm. uh, most notably, uh, Empire of the Sun, Su Empire of the Summer Moon, mm -hmm. uh, by S. C. Gwynn, which is the story of the Comanche rise mm -hmm. in the Southwest. Uh, Ashes on His Boot is basically the story of John Coffee Hayes, Jack Hayes, who was a Tennessean who immigrated to Texas wanting to fight in the war against the Mexicans and got there too late to make it happen, but signed up with Sam Houston to go into the recently organized Texas Rangers. He is the person generally credited with turning the Texas Rangers from disorganized rabble into probably the first truly effective an irregular military force in U.S. history. And that's pretty much his story. 70% of it is fact. Uh, did a lot of research on it. And the rest I came out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, well, he really enjoyed it. Um, so would it give away anything if I asked you what the title means? Um, I don't want you to tell us if it messes it up. Uh, yes, it would. Okay. Uh, yeah. But I, I will only say that it is based on a fairly well-documented Native American ritual that was practiced in this book by Buffalo Hump. Okay, well, we'll leave it at that. That'll make people have to go read the book. Um, so, so why did you want to write this story? Um, did your time in the cavalry make you interested in Western history? But, you know, those aren't related, per se, but I was just, my mind goes in these odd directions. Well, my mind goes in odd directions as well, Cersei. <laughs> and as, in particular, this had absolutely nothing to do with the military or the cavalry when I got started. Mm -hmm. I was living in Houston. Mm -hmm. We were living in Houston. I've always written a lot of poetry and alternate lyrics to songs. Mm -hmm. I was trying to write a song or trying to write alternate lyrics to the Yellow Rose of Texas for a friend of mine's birthday party. And in researching the first set of words to the Yellow Rose of Texas, I discovered that it was about a young woman, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Emily Morgan, or supposedly about her. And it, it, some of this is sort of obscure in history, mm -hmm. in Texas history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I was so intrigued by it that I started reading more and trying to find out more about Emily Morgan, who then became Emily West. And there were actually two Emily West, and there was a third one named Amelia West. And it all gets very muddled until you start finally sorting it out. So, not to belabor the point, this has turned into three books, the third of which is now laying on my desk right here being proofed. It's called Made of Morgan's Point. And it is essentially how Emily Morgan came to be and came to be a hero in of the Texas Revolution by distracting Santa Ana during the Battle of San Jacinto. Ah. So, so all of your books are set in the American West, in Texas, right? Yes, there are, there are only three. And they're, okay. they're set in Texas except for the third because by that time Jack Hayes mm -hmm. had gotten restless and wanted to move further west where there were less people and more opportunity. Mm -hmm. And as a licensed surveyor, he moved to California and became the first sheriff of, of San Francisco County. Ah. So, so um, if I'm getting this right, then Ashes on His Boot is kind of, is, a, is part of a trilogy, and The Maid of Morgan's Point is one. What is the other one? The, the, the third, which is the, the, the second one I wrote, and Made of Morgan's Point, is the is a prequel. Mm -hmm. uh, but the third is called A Civil Sword. And the title of that one is pretty easy because Jack Hayes, when he was growing up, lived from time to time at the Hermitage with his great aunt, Rachel Jackson, Andrew Jackson's wife. Mm. And he spent a lot of time, Jack Hayes spent a lot of time around the old general and later president, Andrew Jackson. Mm. Andrew Jackson gave him a sword and told him that this is a civil sword, son, but sometimes it's got to get bloody before it's civil. Oh, that's very profound. That's cool. <laughs> so so that, that's, the, that's the third book. And Emily West, Emily Morgan is woven through all three of these. Mm. She is the protagonist in Maid of Morgan's Point. And she's pretty much a supporting character all the way through the other two novels. But those are the only three I've written. Okay, well, I'm, I'm quite impressed. Um, so they're all that combination of history and a little bit of fiction, so they're all sort of a blend of histor like historical nonfiction fiction? It, it, no, it, it, it's historical fiction. Okay. In fact, the one that I was, the one uh, Ashes on His Boot, which mm -hmm. is the only national recognition I've gotten, mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, or was a, a, a finalist uh, in, in military fiction, which is a specific 
subgenre of historical fiction. Ah, uh, well, and I see um, I've got the copy of the book right here. You also were a finalist in the Next Generation Indie Book Awards. Yeah, that's, that's the one I was talking about. Yeah. That's the only one. Well, that's quite impressive. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm, I'm no more famous than that. Yeah, well, I'm very impressed. Um, so, so I wanted to um, ask you then. You you alluded to that you wanted that you've always kind of dabbled in um, alternate song lyrics and poetry. Um, how did you decide to become a writer of books? And you know, d did you like it as a kid? Um, did you know you were going to do writing when you grew up? What wh what was the impetus on becoming a writer? That's a very good question. I, I guess the, uh, my short answer would be retirement. Mm. Uh, when I when I retired mm -hmm. from from Caterpillar and. and uh, their joint venture with Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. Uh, I had always written reports, and, and nothing sounds better than reading your own, your own old reports, as some people used to say. <laughs> uh, but what happened was, as, as I was saying earlier, when I was writing the alternate lyrics to the Yellow Rose of Texas, this uh, lady, Emily West, just got stuck in my head. And then that led to Jack Hayes, and that led to Andrew Jackson, and that led to Sam Houston. And, and I have, growing up in Tennessee, I was always wondering about the relationship between Tennessee and Texas that caused Tennessee to be called the volunteer state. So that's all woven into all three books that I have written. And I finally got it all out of my head and onto the printed page, so anybody or nobody can read it. <laughs> well, cool. Hey, so what is your writing process like? Do you have a set routine every morning you get up and you do a certain thing, or how does how does your writing process work? I'm not sure I have a process, but I, I just, I, I write when I, when I feel like it. Some, some days it seems easier in the mornings. Mm -hmm. uh, some days it seems easier in the evening after watching TV or not watching TV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I have been told by my literary coach, Charlotte Cook, that I need, I need more discipline. Mm -hmm. And I need to stop skipping scenes and those kinds of things. And I probably could do that if I had more discipline, but it... To me, it's, a, it's the ultimate creative process. I have no idea where it comes from, uh, except in this particular case with, with the three novels. Mm -hmm. I just knew what the story needed to be. I started writing it 11 years ago on the beach in Aruba mm. and put it aside for a year. And since then, I've been back at it off and on for the whole time. Well, and so that brings me to the question, how do you pick who's going to be telling that particular story? And Ashes on his boot, um, you could have told it from the perspective of Buffalo Hump or somebody else. Um, what drew you so much to Jack Hayes? And um, and I think um, we're, I guess the maid of Morgan's point, the main character or the narrator is uh, a woman. But how do you pick the people who are going to talk? Uh, again, sir, that's a very good question, and I was undisciplined, as we talked about in the last uh, mm -mm. question there. My literary coach finally beat into my head the idea that at least for each chapter of each book that you write, it needs to be told from the perspective of one person. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. In the case of Ashes on His Boot, it was almost all the way through Jack Hayes, because he's a fascinating character in my mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Made of Morgan's Point, for example, each chapter is a different uh, narrator, ah. and it's, it's told in the, uh, the method is called Close Third, which is almost like you were a camera with a microphone sitting on the shoulders of the person who's seeing what's going on. So in Made of Morgan's Point, I alternate 
unlike in the other two novels, between Emily West, General Santa Anna, General Houston, uh, Sam Colt, Samuel Colt, who invented the, pistol, the revolving pistol, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, even uh, Iron Jacket and Buffalo Hump. Wow. So, so there, there are, in the 30 chapters in Made of Morgan's Point, there are probably 15 or 16 different narrators. So that but brings, each one has each one has their own chapter. So that makes me wonder how can you keep those stories all making sense? Um, you, so so that would make it complicated to write. I would think. I would think that you would say, well, you'd get confused. Who's who did what and said what and what the time frame was and all that. You you do have to put down a. a sort of a calendar of events mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and who's doing what when because you do trip over dates pretty easily. That's, a, that, that's very true. And, but I also have a good story editor. My son uh, is uh, my story editor and he is very good at it. He learned uh, a lot some, somewhere uh, so that I, I just use him 90% of the time to bounce the rough manuscripts off of. Well, that's good. Is that Howard? No, that's, uh, that's Michael. Howard was my my researcher and part writer of, of the very first attempt I made. Howard has since gone on to become an artist of some regional note, a watercolor artist of some regional note in, in West Tennessee. Mm. Uh, but he still does some research when I ask him, but uh, he doesn't really read much of what I write until it's done these days. Well, this is this is really an, an, an interesting. The more I, the more we talk, the more questions I have. Um, so, so, um, are you working on any other projects now outside of um, this? You know, these three obviously are done, and you're finishing up um, one. But do you have anything else on the horizon? Another story uh, that's in your yes, head? Yes, ma'am, I certainly do. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, I was working on a memoir which is supposed to be totally true in about my first 25 years of life. Mm -mm. My son, uh, after reading a bit of it, said, you know, I only famous people write memoirs that anybody reads. And I didn't take that advice, so I, I kept writing and kept writing. Finally, I read some of what I had said about my, my father one mm. day, and I had turned him into such a bigot that I decided not to publish it. Oh. <laughs> uh, it, it does have an interesting title. It's called Race, Religion, and the Pursuit of Happiness. Oh, okay. Uh, so I, uh, I have that on a shelf, which I may clean up and offer one day. But meanwhile, in the course of my civilian career, mm -hmm. I've written over 200 pieces of either industrial poetry or alternate lyrics to songs about people that I know, work with, uh, or are, am friends with. And I am being encouraged to just put those together in a compilation and publish them. That's probably what I'll do next. Well, that sounds really cool. I was um, having a flashback to, like, you know, Versailles and these salons and these witty, witty people um, spouting off lampooning things at people when you mentioned that. That might be a really good read, a funny read, you know, something something different. People probably aren't doing a whole lot of that, and so that might have a real good niche niche market. Well, we'll see. I'll, I'll try this one out on you, because this was one I was going to put in there. Is uh -huh. that okay? Okay, go ahead. I love writing books. It's my passion. But I could not write about fashion. The clothes all seem odd, and the models, my God, they look to be all sort of rations. <laughs> well, I'm laughing. I'm not generally a laugher, so that was good. <laughs> you, there may be, there may well, be, there may I, be I, hope. I love limericks, and I, I've written so many. In fact, on Facebook these days, I have a limerick contest going where every morning I publish four lines of a new limerick and ask my friends to write the fifth line. 
Oh, that's really cool. That's fun. That's interactive and fun and um, gets people's minds, you know, going in, in, in all directions. Um, and hey, probably during this pandemic, it's a welcome relief. Um, so getting back to this pandemic, um, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you, so as someone who writes about history and now about limericks and poetry and all that, um, what do you think people can learn from this particular time and place where we are right now in America, you know, in the middle of this pandemic? Do you think there's a lesson we should be learning as a nation? I think, yes. Uh, there is definitely, uh, there, in my mind, there are two lessons to be learned. One, one for me personally, mm. and that's discipline, because we are, we have become uh, an undisciplined uh, element of civilization. And I'm not necessarily only talking about America, I'm just talking about human behavior. Mm -hmm. I think we've lost a lot of the discipline that's required to, to survive on this planet. And secondly, I think we have become lousy stewards. We've become lousy stewards of the relationships we, we have with others, and we've certainly become poor stewards of the planet we live on. So I think those are two significant lessons that will come out of this, and we will, if we survive it, we'll have a better world. Hmm. That gives us things to think about um, in this pandemic. And they're talking about, you know, a second wave. So we may become more disciplined because we have to. Um, good thoughts. So we have a few minutes left. And I just wanted to ask you um, if there was anything you wanted to say about, I don't know, your military career, your books, your writing, just anything that our listeners might like to know. I'm happy that that the the military family museum exists. I didn't know it existed uh, as recently as a year ago. Uh, I'm certainly happy that the family aspects of the military are being uh, memorialized in the way that you folks are doing it. And I would only say that uh, as I was thinking about what you do there. I wish I could come and see it, and maybe someday I'll be able to. But in my third book, mm -hmm. uh, actually in part of the second book, Ashes on the Boot, and certainly in The Civil Sword, I think a, a reader can see the stress that a military family, a wife and kids, or the spouse and, and, the, and the children go through when someone either loves to be in combat or is forced to be away and, and put in harm's way. So I'm really happy that you folks are there and that you're doing what you're doing. Well, thank you very much. I, I, um, it, it started as a nice project, but now it's become a calling because it is so important. And, um, and and so much history, family history has been lost because, you know, nobody was curating it, you know, generations ago. So we're we're trying to catch up. <laughs> right. That's great. Yeah. I'm glad you're there. Keep at it. Well, thank you. Um, so we need to wrap it up. But I wanted to say, um, besides our museum gift shop, which, of course, is closed right now, um, where we have your books, um, where else can people buy your books? Do you have an author page? How do we find um, your books? And please give us the titles again and all that information. Okay. Uh, well, the easiest is to buy, obviously the most commercial way, and that's on Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go to Amazon.com and type in my name, Robert Wunsch, and two, uh, in another few weeks, three books should pop up, mm -hmm. uh, Ashes on His Boot, mm -hmm. and A Civil Sword, Okay. and the third will be made of Morgan's Point. You might, uh, if Amazon still hasn't done their homework correctly, as I've asked them to, you might still see Thorn of Behar or Thorn of Bear uh, mm -hmm. in there. That was my very first effort 
but it's what all three of these other books are based on. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like cliff notes on everything I've been talking about this morning. I don't want anyone to read that. It was terrible. It was before I got a literary coach and before I got smart. Okay. <laughs> but so, uh, but if, no, if, if, ignore, <laughs> if you see Thorn of the Heart, ignore that one. Okay. And, and pick up one or more of the others. The only other places they're available are uh, in uh, Arizona's Root is available. Signed copies of it are available at the Texas Ranger Museum in Waco. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In their gift shop. And in the gift shop at a place in my hometown, Union City, Tennessee, a $200 million interactive educational and museum of mid-America. It's called uh, Discovery Park America. Ah. And it's the, it's the number one tourist attraction in the state of Tennessee these days. Wow. It was started by my friend Robert Kirkland, who I roomed with in college, and he went on to make millions, and I went on to do what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, very cool. Very cool. Hey, hey, Robert, how do you spell your last name so people can go into Amazon and look it up? It's W-U-E-N-C-H. Whiskey Uniform Echo, November Charlie Hotel. Oh, very good. <laughs> well, listen, it has been a pleasure uh, speaking with you today, um, all the way from New Mexico to Tennessee to Ohio to Texas. So you're in Ohio, right? Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah, and and so it's been great talking to you. And so, but we need to wrap it up. Um, and so, I wanted to say once again that this has been Circe Olson Westner, the director of the Museum of the American Military Family in Tejeras, New Mexico. And we were speaking with Robert Wunsch via the telephone. Um, I hope that. You have enjoyed this interview and look up his books on Amazon. And I wanted just to thank you, Robert, for um, speaking with us this morning. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks again, Cersei. Okay. Well, we'll be in touch soon because I'm going to be sending you a copy of um, On Freedom's Frontier, which you contributed to. But thank you very much, and I'll talk to you soon.